This is my opportunity to introduce Ben Affleck and Lorene Powell Jobs. Um, Lorene and, and Ben have both recently been, uh, been in Eastern Congo uh, and uh, traveled to the region, and they're going to talk about that. Um, in addition to being an actor and a, uh, and a writer and a director, Ben Affleck has, is an activist and a philanthropist. Uh, he has been traveling to Eastern Congo since, I think, back to 2007. Uh, and in 2010, he decided to launch an initiative there. Uh, it's the Eastern Congo Initiative, ECI, and it's a US-based advocacy and grant-making organization, and it's through which much of his philanthropy is taking place. Uh, it supports community-based initiatives <clears throat> in, excuse me, <clears throat> Congolese-led organizations in the region, uh, and uh, he's going to have an opportunity to talk about that for a while with us today. Obviously, it's a very, very troubled region. Loreen Powell Jobs is principal of the Emerson uh, Collective, uh, which is an organization which works with entrepreneurs in an effort to achieve social goals, uh, social reform efforts around the world, in fact. She's also an investor in the, um, in the Eastern Congo Initiative. She's also, I think a lot of you know, that Lorene founded uh, College Track, which is a, a program designed to help young people from, uh, from difficult situations succeed, make their way to college and through college. And it's got an extraordinary success rate uh, of kids graduating from high school and moving on to college. In fact, it's 100% success rate, which is hard to improve on. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Lorene and Ben. I should note that um, apparently Ben Affleck at no times isn't making films, and so last night and this morning he finished a film for us that we're premiering here and that you're about to see. I know that uh, they have uh, power. Power is in, in my community, my people. They don't know what to do. We refuse the development that is beginning from the capital. We want a development that comes from the base, from the village. People in Congo are so resilient. Amazing people who function in an impossible situation and who do good work. Those are the people that we want to reinforce to give them the tools to do their work well to bring healing into their community. I've been traveling to Eastern Congo over the last four years. When I first came here, I was stunned by the enormity of the humanitarian crisis. War, militias, child soldiering, gender-based violence, starvation, preventable disease. Millions have died over the last 15 years. But I was also amazed at the power of the Congolese people to rise above this find solutions to their own problems with amazing success. The Eastern Congo Initiative supports these local organizations, leaders, and advocates, and we're committed to working with them to create lasting change in the lives of vulnerable children, survivors of sexual violence, individuals working for economic opportunity, or communities seeking peace and reconciliation. And uh, we're extremely honored that you've led us into your lives here today. What to do, what to do with these children? Others, many of them are in the street. They need to be at school. They need to get education. Kumaisha yambele, niliwaka na mbazazi yote walikuwa na enea, baba na mama. Badai, baba kafariki. Maisha ikakuwa nguvu sana. Tukafukuzua mnyumbe, tulikuwa kamo. Basi, tukaona omwe tuingie mbarabara, tuanze chitafutia, tafutia siye peki. Nyo vyo tuliki Afrika pa ku Children Voice. ECI helps Children's Voice provide Basubi and over 600 other children annually access to primary schooling, vocational training, and a safe, loving home. Vrema Children's Voice ime nisaidia sana. Kusema initoshe chini, kusema nifika pa kwenye niko, antuka na furai sana. Lakini hapa nika wakasema nianze kutembeza gari mimi napasha pata kazi ya kutembeza gari kama napata kitu kidogo napasha nisaidie Now it is time for hope 
that is more than giving an injection. That is more than taking a scalpel and fix the body. Because people know to be the image of God, to, to live full, the, the full life is what we call healing. So heal Africa is about full life. Kuyangu wakili naona ile kipindi nye lipitikaka. Ni naona wale wenye wali nifanyake le ajali. Kupata matunzo, nilipataka ajali na wamaji maji, wakanibebesha mimba, kisha wakanitupa mpori, mbarabara, kisha wakanilokota, wakanitia kwa opitale. At the age of 13, Christine was kidnapped and raped by armed militias. Since coming to Heal Africa, she has had seven surgeries to repair the damage. Ju, kufatana na hii magonjwa yetu, tunakuwa hapa wa mama wabingi. Wanatoka kumanyumbabu wa wana espuari kama wataponu. Mea kifika hapa, atakuta wakonsere, watampa moyo, atakuta wenzake wagonjwa, watampa moyo. Kume na shi tunaendelea kuhishi na tunatuko na espuari kama tuko watu saa wengine tu. Laissez l'Afrique à penser qu'il fallait changer. Donc travailler les jeunes pour qu'elles-mêmes puissent créer l'emploi. Le Congo est grand aussi, mais nous pensons que petit à petit, on pourrait quand même faire aussi quelque chose. Il est d'accord que vacances se coulent, dans le jour où nous allons nous camatia, dans le jour où nous allons nous quitter sur la ville. Nous avons 13 ans. Armée, nous faisons 5 ans. Let Africa Live has given over 1,300 teens like Innocent a chance to begin a new life through programs in counseling, vocational training, and entrepreneurship. Since graduating from LAV, Innocent has taken part in ECI's microgrant program to help him start a new welding business with fellow graduates. Businesses like theirs provide the seeds for growth in the local war-torn economy. Uh, it's an organization that approaches things the way I did from a, from a community level, starting at the ground up, and they put their efforts, their money, their time where it should be and where it will make the most difference. So I'm pr proud to be a part of this. When people talk about an investment risk in the DRC, you know, think about the risk that the people you're helping face. You know, not only do they face personal risk just because of where they live, they also face the risk within their own community of stepping up and being willing to take a chance and put themselves on the line. So our risk, the way I look at it is our, our risk is easy. Thanks, Ben. Sure. Our risk is easy. I like that line. Um, and I remember meeting some of the people in the film that we saw during our trip last year. It's really yeah, I mean, a lot of that hearing their food. hearing their stories and you know obviously stories uh, of struggle and tragedy, but also of hope and resiliency. And I think that comes through really clearly here. Yeah, it's one of the things that's a challenge to balance because on the one hand, you're you're dealing with a place in the world that has. Uh, some of the most deaths, some of the worst tragedies, some of the most brutal things happen to the most vulnerable members of society. And yet when you just hit that, people with that, mm -hmm. it's me or anybody, I, it's too much to sort of absorb. And, and what it really, it doesn't do justice to people there because it fails to recognize what people are doing that's hopeful. You know, and that's right. what I really wanted that to show is you see some of those people and they don't even, some of them don't go into the, the brutalization that they've endured. But you see that they're taking care of their own lives. They're taking initiative for their own lives mm -hmm. in a way that's, I think, extraordinarily powerful and speaks to um, what, what, what can be done. Right. Um, actually, before we go into the work of ECI, uh, I was hoping that maybe you could ground the people in this room a little bit in the history of the conflict in Eastern Congo. Uh, I know that, that some people know it very well and some people are new to the the history and it's very conflicting and painful and complicated but something that struck me when we traveled together was uh, the depth of your research and understanding of the painful past and present so maybe you could take a few minutes just to give people a bit of a 
broad brush strokes of uh, sure. history the, of what's been The few been minutes guideline on. being uh, <laughs> the most important. I'll just interrupt you if it goes away too <laughs> just, long. Uh, it, is, it is complicated, but again, one of the things about saying that it's complicated is I, tend, I think that tends to be quite off-putting. People just write it off. Well, it's too complicated or it's too hopeless and it's too miserable. So let's focus our attention elsewhere. It's a paradox where you have a place that needs it the most, gets the mm -hmm. least attention because of the, of the problems that it's enduring. Um, Congo was, um, well, you can read Adam Hothschild's great book about King Leopold's ghost if you want to go back to the, the uh, mm -hmm. colonial era. But it emerged from colonialism uh, under um, Mobutu, in effect. And Mobutu was, well, the United States actually and the Belgians combined to uh, help overthrow the first democratically elite, elected leader there, who was a guy named Patrice mm -hmm. Lumumba. After that, uh, essentially, um, Mobutu was installed. He ruled uh, the kleptocracy between 1962, I think, and 1996. Uh, and during that time, the infrastructure was really debilitated, and a culture kind of became pervasive that you just sort of had to take what you could get because n neither opportunities nor goods were, were going to be made available to you. Simultaneously, the, uh, the ramp up to the genocide was happening in Rwanda. Um, which had to do with the civil war between uh, exiled the Tutsis and the Hutu power organization that was present in Rwanda. The um, war came to a head around the genocide. And when the genocide happened, you had these um, Hutus killing uh, mostly Tutsis, but also some moderate Hutus. And when the RPF, which was the outside Rwandan government, came in and eventually overthrew that genocidal regime, the, rem the remnants of these, you know, and, and these people could easily be cared, uh, compared you know, less favorably to, to Nazis, were um, pushed out and escaped into what was then Zaire. And kind of introduced this tremendously toxic, uh, you know, post-genocide, people who had committed genocide environment into Eastern Congo, which hadn't been like that before. You know, Eastern Congo was a place that people from Rwanda used to go and dance and party. It was known for its music. It was known for its... It's freedom and it's wonderful sort of flavor and and, um, and right what, across the lake. So the the countries are extremely proximate. Exactly, you know, they're right, right by lake across. Kivu. Yeah, and then once they went in there, essentially, make a long story short, the Rwandes uh, they sort of camped out on the other side. The Rwandes ultimately attacked, and they sort of set up a front organization with a guy named Laurent Kabila, went all the way to Kinshasa, overthrew Mobutu. Uh, and when that happened, it led to a series of events. Kabila turned on the Rwandese, and uh, basically the country degenerated into chaos. It had as many as six armies that were present. It set off, there were two, two wars, one against you know, Kabila and one then once Kabila turned on the Rwandese. Uh, a mad grab for resources, which is the blessing and the curse of this region, is that you know, mm. uh, gold, tantalum, tantalum cassiterite, coltan, uh, copper, lumber, you know, it just goes on and on and on, are, are present there. So everyone from the Angolas to the Ugandans to the Rwandese all sort of dived in and went after that. And, and what happened was the fabric of society essentially broke down. You had a, a culture of uh, impunity and violence, and the state wasn't able to exert any authority. And those situations, and a small-scale war continued, um, basically there since then. So you're dealing with a war-torn place, a place where um, you know, the value of life has been greatly diminished. A friend of mine who lived there told me, you know, before 96, if you saw a dead body, it would be a big deal. You'd run and tell somebody. So yeah. shortly thereafter, it was just, you always saw dead bodies. Yeah. And um, that is still very much the flavor of, of uh, the East. And I think you know, it, more than three million people have died since the war started. One in five children dies before the age of five. Um, it's a Hundreds place. Hundreds of thousands of women have been raped, and, and indeed, brutalized, and continue to be raped and brutalized and demeaned and dehumanized in a in a really unacceptable, barbaric, uh, terrible way. So, into this context, you came and visited, and I think uh, people would be very interested, me too, in understanding what personally drew you to this region. Uh, why has it become your life's work in addition to your obvious busy film career? And uh, what, do you, what do you hope to achieve over the span of how long you work there? Well, in terms of, you know, on, uh, in one sense, 
what drew me to this is I, I, I like to think the same as so many people here who are drawn to the same kind of work and who work much more tirelessly and uh, with much more sacrifice, um, including you, Lorraine, than, than I do. So I take it for granted that people understand that drive. To me, focusing on Eastern Congo had to do with um, you know, feeling like this was the place because it was the worst of the worst, because they were having the most suffering, because uh, when, when the genocide was happening in Darfur, uh, it, could, it could safely be said that, you know, one-sixteenth of the people were dying in Darfur as were dying in, in Congo. It's, it, it, it seemed to me that um, that's what was in the most need, and that's really what I was uh, drawn to. And, and, you know, what we hope to accomplish is... Uh, you know, that's well, a, so did you go and visit the region? Did you read something yeah. about it, and then you felt compelled, and you went? Yeah, and I mean, what happened was, to be honest, I didn't even know. I was asked, as a lot of celebrities were, to get involved in the in the uh, situation in, in, Darfur, in Darfur and help kind of uh, shed some light on that and bring awareness. I was sort of the tenth celebrity in line, and so I felt a bit like there's a lot of awareness already going on here. Um, and George Clooney. Exactly yeah. behind George, that's you know, uh, <laughs> it's just kind of. Thought maybe I should get in another line. Um, and in all seriousness, I read a book as I was reading about Darfur because I thought, well, if I do get involved with this, I don't want to be a dilettante. It's not I, the whole idea of being a celebrity who you know, shows up somewhere and takes a picture holding a kid's hand in a hospital and going home was just so gross, you know. And I thought, yeah. you know, I just don't want to. I just can't do that. So I read about it in the course of which I came across this writing about Congo, about how uh, three million people had died there from conflict and preventable disease and starvation. And I, thought, I felt embarrassed that I didn't know anything about it and shocked. And since I didn't know anything about it, I thought, you know, um, that maybe um, I'm not George Clooney. But, uh, you know, given that, uh, you know, uh, there was still some light to be, to be shown on that. And that was a really, I thought that was a good use of my time. And then I started traveling there. And because I am an actor, I had the opportunity to, really was blessed that people would sit down with me and I could learn. So I did a kind of year of postgraduate work, essentially. I didn't actually graduate from undergraduate, so I can't technically call you just, that. But you just leapfrog exactly. to postgrad. Yeah. And I just jumped to PhD. Um, <laughs> and I went around and I talked to people in the field, academics, mm -hmm. um, people, uh, ph philanthropists, you know, people at NGOs, people working on the ground, survivors, uh, and did sort of visited you know, uh, eight or so countries in that kind of larger conflict matrix, whether it's you know, South Sudan or Uganda or Rwanda mm -hmm. or Burundi and Kenya. And, um, tried to get a handle on it, and as I did, I really had a, I developed a sort of clear sense of what I wanted to do. So, um, a lot of just one last question about this whole celebrity thing. Um, no, it's, but a fine, lot of, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> a lot of people use their celebrity for good, but through media and communications network. Um, so, why did you decide to not just uh, because you actually can? can get media, yeah. you can get attention, you can post on it, you could tweet about it, and um, that would disrupt your life much less than actually spending a lot of time in the region, meeting with people, being under the radar, uh, trying to construct a new and effective and lasting and sustainable organization. It's a, it's a very different way to intervene than a lot of celebrities do. Uh, and so given given that you chose to found ECI in this fashion, um, you know, what were you thinking around, around sure. that kind of intervention versus really just using media and communications? I think it's an interesting question. I, I, and you know, I do think there's value to uh, the kind of attention that celebrities can bring. I, you know, I didn't, um, it's just a part of the culture now. People are, are drawn and attracted to that, in particular people in the media. And you know, one of the big struggles that, that many of you in this room face every day is how can I get people to pay attention to this? How can I get people to be aware? And because yeah. if through that, I can maybe uh, engender action. So I assume that that would be the bulk of what I would do. Um, and I just wanted to be qualified to do it. I wanted to be able to you know, sit up here and answer questions and actually feel like I know what I'm talking about rather than going, like, I hope it's over soon because <laughs> we're getting to the end of uh, what I have to offer. So, I, I went through, you know, as I say, I really started educating myself. And in the course of that, I found, you know, I was able to see a lot of NGOs who were doing fabulous work there, mind you, um, you know, mostly. And, and I, they were generous. They gave me their time. They let me see what they were doing. Uh, and so I got this wonderful education in that sense. But I also discovered, you know what? 
there's something that I think is missing in this particular region from the United States, which was mm -hmm. there is no US-based group that was working strictly with community-based organizations in Eastern Congo. And as part of my philosophy growing up and my house and the politics of the way I, I grew up, and also um, from what I saw when I was there, it seemed to me that there was a tremendous power in um, the, the ability to change one's life if you're part of the community, mm -hmm. if you have skin in that game, mm -hmm. if you live there, if you grew up there, if it's your relatives and your friends, you're invested in it in a way that um, you know, people who, who are at uh, 30,000 feet are, are, are not, even though they are, want to be. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how, for me, was I'd like to try to enable these people. They desperately want to do it. They, um, they're dedicated. They live there. An investment in these people will last forever uh, in building their capacity to change their lives mm -hmm. and to change their, their uh, neighbors' lives. And so that's uh, what I set out to do. But I thought, you know what, I'll couple this with advocacy. Because there is also a lot to be said uh, for advocacy, for, for changing the uh, way, for example, that the US government acts vis-a-vis -vis Congo. And I thought that grant making offered a kind of credibility to advocacy because I think we've all mm -hmm. seen advocates who um, have a lot to say, but, you, but then when you, I've kind of drilled down with them, I, I don't have any clear sense of where the opinions are coming from. And so I wanted to have the, the integrity of doing that. And I also wanted to make a, a tangible difference on the ground. Mm -hmm. So speaking about on the ground, talk to us about how ECI is constructed, uh, who works there, and what kind of organizations are you starting to fund? Well, there's two things that are really important to me in this organization. Um, one, uh, you know, the understanding that I'm not the expert in this in any capacity. And the first thing I wanted to do is surround myself with seasoned, smart philanthropists. Who, who got it, who could help me, who also were invested in this. I make it a, a small group so that there was, uh, so that we could be nimble, uh, so that there could be communication. Uh, and so, you know, I, we, I got really lucky, you know. Uh, uh, we got partners like Howard Buffett and, and um, you know, Google and Pamela Midiar and, and at the, uh, you know, and, uh, and you and, uh, and uh, Cindy McCain and others who, um, you know, I went to and said, how can we do this the best way? because you've all done this on a very big scale and, and very successfully. And again, the sort of counterpoint to that was who we're going to deal with on the ground, who we're going to hire, are going to be Congolese people. Congolese people who are familiar mm -hmm. with this community and these groups we're working with who are doing the m and who are following up, who are liaising um, with these folks. Um, because that's really what it's about. It's not about... Um, developing uh, new ideas. It's about working with those who already have these ideas and helping them do it more effectively. And having a deep respect for the knowledge of people in their communities. They, um, know, they understand problems, they understand solutions, and so sometimes they just need a bit of a lever that allows them to achieve that. Absolutely. So I, like, I like that respect that you bring to it. You know, I was in that situation where I thought, well, these philanthropists are more qualified than I am, and the people in the community-based organizations are more qualified than I am. So, so what do you do exactly? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just go around shaking hands. And, uh, <laughs> but it's really, thank you, and it's really rewarding, and it's borne itself out so far. You know, working with my smart people, everybody gets, but also working with uh, those folks on the ground who are committed, it's just, it's just amazing, you know. I mean, the, the, mm. just to tell a brief story, you know, I like uh, Children's Voice that you saw up there, who are, um, who's providing, you know, those kids are former child soldiers, they're orphans, they're kids who literally live on the street um, and have nothing, don't have shoes, don't have a place to stay. It's 15 bucks a month to get each of those kids into, uh, one of those kids into Children's Voice. And they're educated in, you know, they get the, a classic education, they get a trade education, they get food, they get a place to live, and most importantly, maybe, they so are socialized with one another. They learn to empathize with one another. If you have little girls in your class who you grow up with, you recognize them as people and not people that, uh, and, and not objects that you can stab and rape and brutalize and pass around in a mm -hmm. militia, but human beings. Um, and you know, I mean, look, my mother was a, a teacher for 30 years. She taught sixth grade. And I'm sure many of you have um, kids who are eight, nine, 10, 15, whatever. In my experience, kids, it's like, in this country, so many of our children behave like it's the biggest burden to go to school. You know what I mean? <laughs> to be separated from the Xbox for six hours <laughs> is uh, unspeakable horror. Right. 
I went into Children's Voice, and these kids, and there's 60 kids in a classroom, three to a desk, they're, they're packed teaching in there. classical yeah. reading, writing, arithmetic, and these kids are raising their hand, couldn't wait to be part of it, dying to be in this classroom. And that's the kind of, I mean, there, these, some of these kids are five and six years old and just breaking your heart, little kids with big eyes who want to learn, mm. you know, who want to make their lives better. And, you know, when I saw that, I, I realized fully, it was sort of cemented that this is the approach. This is how you take a big situation mm. with a lot of damage. And people go, well, this, you have, you know, lack of state security, you know, lack of education, health, and we can point to all these sectors. Which all the breakdown of the government right. sector. But, but when you see that you put it together one person at a time through these programs, that's not me over there saying, you know, bonjour, how, you know. Uh, that's what I may be least qualified for, actually. Um, but that it's, you saw them, Congolese teachers who are models, who are examples, women. Mm -hmm. um, that is changing that community, and I swear to you that is changing, changing the world. You know, you're going to a place where people view women and view life differently. You change that imprint. You've done something extraordinarily uh, significant, in my view. Um, can you talk a little bit about love? Uh, it, in French, it's Let Africa Live. It's a reintegration program. And we saw uh, also love um, on the film here. Innocent is one of, one of the people uh, that, we ended, that we met and we heard his story. And uh, because there is a decade and a half of, of such brutal war and conflict, um, a lot of the 20 plus year olds uh, were children who were then, who were kidnapped, um, brought in as child soldiers or for the girls as wives or sex slaves to uh, the militias. Uh, and so now with a bit less conflict around the country, there, there's a great need for reintegration of people who miss their childhood, who miss this period of education and need to understand how to live productive and social lives. So can you talk a bit about that organization? Yes. The, as you said, it means Let Africa Live. And it's, again, as you said, living in a world where now all of a sudden some of these militias, though not all, are, are going away or are dissipating. You're, if you're being flooded with these kids who were 13, 14. Again, I'm sure many of you have kids that age. And what Innocent told me when we weren't shooting was, uh, you know, yeah, I was involved with many killings. And I saw, you know, many, and, and much fighting. And so he's 13, he's 14, he's killing people, people are shooting at him, he's seeing people, uh, you know, be died, be dehumanized. And it, I wouldn't doubt it if he was both a victim and, and part of the problem. And these, these problems are often, you know, intertwined in a way that's not convenient. But what I kind of I think is brilliant about Let Africa Live is they're taking a kid who was in a militia for five years, 13 to 18, committed crimes, also suffered the abuse of crimes. Mm. When he comes out of there, what, what is his contribution to society going to be? He, all he has is a Kalashnikov and um, you know his history as a soldier, basically. Instead, he comes out and there's a place for him. And believe me, there needs to be more of it. They need more money. We need to have more centers that are doing this. And that's part of why I'm here, frankly. But he comes out, what he's emblematic of is through that training, and again, through that socialization, through his peers, and through the, the networking, and we, um, you know, we funded a kind of a landscape for them on where the jobs really were, so that they could you know, put people yeah, in. Yeah, the training to the Yeah, exactly. And in, in getting him, you know, he's welding, now he's got his own shop, we went to his shop. I mean, it's not, um, you know, by our standards, it's very modest. Um, but what it's doing there is, is, is extraordinarily profound because mm -hmm. now the economy's working better, there's more education, there's a better model, a guy is being healed, and also a potential problem is being taken away. You want to talk about how do we stop this? Mm -hmm. Murdering, soldiering, raping, that's the way it has to be done. It's, it is brick by brick and person by person and through education and that, that I know it's um, had a profound effect you know, on all of us mm -hmm. when, when we went there. And they have so many stories like that. This young girl named Laba, who was kidnapped by a militia and, and just as a sex slave when she was 13, repeatedly raped, had a child while she was there, eventually escaped three years later, ran to the town, basically dead, um, and was found by, again, Let Africa Live. And by the time we met her and we're talking to her, she was, um, she was going, she was 19, and she was going to university and she wanted to be, a lawyer, to be a lawyer. She wanted yeah. to do, um, you know, gender studies, mm -hmm. defense, you know, women's uh, mm. stuff. And it was, it's, it, it's remarkable. It can be, there are terrors, but there really are successes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I know it's almost time to go to Q&A, but I want to talk a little bit about the advocacy portion of ECI because I know uh, that's, that's uh, equally important. And you recently had a congressional testimony, and we're advocating for more U.S. involvement in the DRC. Um, talk to us about what you think is the appropriate role of the U.S. Uh, in the DRC, both uh, at the governmental level and at the individual level. Uh, a lot of the breakdown, obviously, in civil society that we saw was the abrogation, due to the abrogation of the government from its roles of building up institutions and structures. Uh, that would allow people to have full and productive lives. So, so recognizing that that's the framework within which we're operating with ECI, uh, what do you think is the best role for the U.S.? Well, you know, it's, it's very tricky because you look at it from the point of view of, of what's needed and the point of view of what we're able to do. And uh, we commissioned the white paper from independent experts, which will be available for anybody who wants to read it. And I know there are some people in this crowd who actually will read it, which is uh, yeah. pretty cool. And, um, and then that has a number of recommendations that are sort of very specific. And I won't bore you going into all of them about you know, multilateral efforts in terms of regional neighbors. And um, a special advisor is really important to us. Mm -hmm. um, but really what it comes down to, I think, for the United States government, in my experience, doing this kind of advocacy for a number of years, is two things. One, it's, pro it's strategy, and two is priority. Okay? You have to have a cohesive strategy from the US government point of view towards another country if you're going to have any impact whatsoever. And when things are a priority to us, whether it's, it's uh, you know, Egypt or Iraq or Afghanistan or India or China or um, you know, so many countries in the world, it's because we have, I mean, look, maybe not perfect coordination, but there is a synergy. Okay? State, DOD, White House, Congress, they all have an idea that they need to be on the same page and to be working collectively. There's this idea with, with uh, Congo that's frankly just not a priority because it's not a, you know, in our national interest. That's what the job of an advocate, I, I think, is to do, is to, to raise a hand, to get others to raise a hand with you, to develop a constituency and say, this is in our national interest. You know, the brutalization of this many women, um, mm -hmm. the death of this many children, uh, the lack of security that these human beings are living in speaks directly to our values, speaks directly to, the, to, to our values as core as the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, which says that all men are created equal, which says that we hold, uh, you know, that we value universal civil rights. And if our foreign policy doesn't reflect uh, those values, then we make a mockery of it. And that sort of moral insistence, I think, is really important. Uh, I think when you make the, um, to make it a, a priority and to making uh, it a, a strategy is equally important than trying to unify all these disparate, um, you know, agencies in the federal government is difficult and testifying before Congress is a step, doing the white paper is a step, um, and, and being an advocate on television, on the internet is, is also mm -hmm. a step. And it's not going to happen overnight, but it happens in aggregate as mm -hmm. you sort of Sometimes it feels a little Sisyphean, but you know, you can push it up the uh, push it up the mm -hmm. hill, and you know, the U.S. government, uh, as as the president says, you know, sort of moves a little bit like a cruise ship. You know, it takes a long time to affect change, but then once you kind of get it going, hopefully, we'll be headed in the right direction. We've seen a lot of change so far, and we're hoping, for example, a special advisor will be appointed soon.